Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. In Adventure of an Architecture, it's often painted as a magic fix. This silver bullet that's going to provide loose coupling. It's scalable. It's resilient. But when you really dig into it, those claims are only half true. This post on Medium, Adventure of an Architecture, the good, the bad, and the ugly truth about when to use it and when to run away. And if you've watched any of my videos, you know that I got to add some more depth and nuance to this about what's true, what's misunderstood, and what's missing. And to be clear, I think this post is actually pretty good, but let's jump into the first point so I can add some detail. So the first claim about Adventure of an Architecture is generally about loose coupling. But is it... Your services become like independent contractors rather than codependent employees. They can evolve, scale, and even fail without bringing down the entire system. Is it true? Uh, not exactly. But before I explain why, I'd like to thank Current for sponsoring this video. Current's an event native data platform that feeds real-time business-critical data with historical context and fine-grained streams from origination to destination, enhancing data analytics and AI outcomes. For more on Current, check out the link in the description. So in a typical synchronous request response, let's say it's an HTTP API, gRPC, whatever the case may be, let's say we're talking about in the domain of a shipment, maybe we have when the shipment's actually dispatched, you often think about this, if you're getting a package shipped to you, you get a notification, maybe a text message or email that it's on its way. If this is happening in the particular boundary that you're calling to perform that notification is on fire, it's got high latency or it's just unavailable and completely, this request is not gonna work. On the flip side, with Adventure of an Architecture and Publish Subscribe, if Dispatch publishes that event to our message broker, let's say some type of topic, we could have other different types of boundaries, maybe like billing that has to then charge the customer's credit card because the order was shipped. It can deal with that and process that completely independently. That's all great. And then finally, if the notification portion there that actually sends out that email or text message, it's still on fire, Nothing, there's no issues with it. Sure, that email or text message isn't going out, it's not being processed, but everything else is functioning correctly. And then finally, once it is online and available, then it can go ahead and process that message. They're completely independent. Now, it's great that both producer and consumer don't need to be online at the same time, but a little bit of the misconception here is that loose coupling means less coupling, but that's not really the case you still have to know that that producer is producing that specific event, that message, where it's publishing that me message, to which topic, to which broker. It needs to understand the structure of the message. If you need to change that schema, that structure of that event, you need to version it or convey that to your other consumers that you're publishing a new version of it or a different event entirely. What you've done with the loose coupling is you've, you've removed the temporal aspect. And that's great, but that's what you've done. You still have coupling. Just like that HTTP API, you need to know what the payload is for the request. It's just reversed now that you need to know from the consumer's point of view, what the structure of the event is. You've kind of changed that direction, but you still have coupling. Now let's talk about the half-truths of scalability. The examples, you need to handle Black Friday traffic, just spin out more instances of your order processing service or your payment service independently. It allows you to scale different parts of your system based on actual demand, not theoretical needs. Sounds great, right? Adventure of an Architecture allows you to scale horizontally, but there's more to it than that, obviously. Things you gotta deal with like back pressure and queue depth, and what I really call just moving the bottleneck. Here's what I mean by that. Let's say we have a billing boundary, it's processing messages from our topic, from our broker, but we have more messages coming in. We can't keep up, we don't have that throughput. So what do we do? Sure, we just horizontally scale by adding more instances. This is often cons uh, called the competing consumers pattern. So we just are processing more messages concurrently. But when I say move in the bottleneck, that's what I just did because we couldn't scale billing. So we horizontally scaled. Now what do we do with the database? If you just added that much more work to the database because you're processing more messages concurrently, can it scale? Maybe not. You've just moved the bottleneck anything else downstream, any other infrastructure, any other boundaries, can these scale with you? And that really depends. Can you scale it? Sometimes you just have no option and you can't. For example, if you're using some third-party service that's rate limited, what are you supposed to do? If you can't change that rate limit, you're bound to what that rate limit is. You can only scale up to that. So those were a couple half-truths about the benefits, but on the flip side here, what are the half-truths with some of the dark side? Well, complexity. The example here to say is, remember when debugging meant following a simple call stack? Welcome to event hell, where every single interaction 
triggers dozen events across multiple services and tracing what went wrong because of the detective story that would make Sherlock Holmes cry. But the half truth here is this isn't specific to event driven architecture. You've probably heard the horror stories of somebody has this synchronous request response from HTTP APIs for all these different microservices where a client makes a request to one service, that makes a call to some other service, then it makes a call to a third service and even nested farther than that, service C is also calling service D. And guess what? Something is unavailable, has some type of issue, there's some type of fault. How do you deal with this? You deal with this by not putting yourself in this situation in the first place. Often the root cause is having workflow that's spanning all these different boundaries when it really shouldn't. This isn't about messaging or event-driven architecture. This is about having workflow that filters through and snakes through all your different boundaries. What it really is, is a larger workflow that's a handoff from one boundary to another typically. So my example here, say I have a sales boundary. When it finishes, that's the handoff to another boundary. For example, we're talking about the domain of shipping, that's going to dispatch. When an order is delivered and completed, then it goes into billing. If I kind of zoom in here on that center dispatch, what it really looks like is an order's dispatch, it arrives where the sh shipment's being picked up, it's loaded onto the vehicle, it's departed from there, it arrives where your final destination is, the constant E, then it's actually delivered. When that delivered happens, that's really what's kicking off. So we're going from booked from our order side, delivered, which I just illustrated, and that's what kicks off the next session to billing for the order to be invoiced. Boundaries are often for handoffs. You have one boundary that has a workflow inside of it that hands off to something else that has its own workflow. It really isn't one massive workflow. Now, another half truth on the dark side is event ordering. Events don't always arrive in the order that they were sent. Imagine processing a user deleted account before a user created account. Your system needs to handle these scenarios gracefully, which adds layers of complexity you never anticipated. The half truth is this can be self-inflicted. Just like the example said, it was really talking about CRUD. So if I go back to a shipment, there is a very large difference between shipment created, shipment updated, as opposed to dispatched, arrived, loaded, departed, delivered. There's a very big difference here. When we're talking about CRUD, typically what's happened is you're using events in event-driven architecture as a means to distribute data rather than workflow. So if you have CRUD and you're using events as a way to propagate data, then yes, this could be a problem if they're out of order. But like they said, when you have that deleted event, well, delete what data? I don't have the original one to begin with. Then I get a created one, so I create it. Now I'm out of sync. You're just doing this because you're propagating data everywhere. But you can process messages out of order. And I say process messages out of order because if you're using multiple instances, competing consumers, what I was illustrating earlier, you could process them at the same time, even though you're using FIFO first in, first out. So my example here though, is a part of workflow. So let's say we're creating a shipping ladle, but I need to know that the order has been placed and billed. So for that, I have, uh, I'm using end service bus as the example here. So let's say that the build comes in actually first. I can just mark with state that I have that the order's been billed. I can call process order. But because the order hasn't been placed, I haven't received that event yet, I'm not gonna actually go and create my shipping label. Then separately, once that message that should have came in first, the order placed, I process it, I call order process, and then yes, this condition is gonna pass, and then I can go create my shipping label. Yes, does this add complexity? Sure, can you deal with messages being out of order? Absolutely. What I like to think that example as is a policy. It's really a gatekeeper saying, okay, these different things had to have occurred before we can continue on. And again, I wasn't criticizing this post, just adding some depth to the points that it had, which is this one. The best architecture isn't the most sophisticated. It's the one that matches your current needs while providing a path for future growth. What I like calling, give yourself options. EDA can be that path, but only if you understand both its power and its pitfalls. Loose coupling is great, but it doesn't mean no coupling. It's about time. Scalability, being able to scale independently is great, but it's also just moving the bottleneck. Complexity, if you have workflows that are spanning all kinds of different boundaries, events aren't gonna save you. In ordering, do you really need ordering? Do you? And if you do, you can deal with it. Now my favorite part, get in the comments and let me know if you've run into any of these half-truths and the pain that you felt, 
or if it's something different and it's some different EVA pitfall, let me know. And I really do appreciate everybody that supports my channel. I really do appreciate it. If you want to support my channel, you can join. The link's in the description on how to join. If you did find this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. And please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.